<laughs> I'm here to speak to you about making design uh, by committee work. Who am I? I am James A. Rosen, as Pete said. Uh, the A is important because James Rosen is a Fox News contributor. I am not. Um, sometimes I have a beard or a mustache. Sometimes I have a pig nose. Sometimes my avatar is my cat, Whiskey. Uh, I'm James A. Rosen pretty much everywhere on the web if you want to hit me up afterwards. I work for Fastly, where we make the internet faster. And I used to work for Zendesk, where I helped turn this interface into this interface. So our engineering team here uh, worked side by side with the product uh, managers. We to figure out sort of what wasn't working for our customers as we really expanded our audience. We went out on customer visits, we prototyped, uh, we ended up building an entire new UI in the browser. And um, that ended up being one of the first Ember.js applications in production. So today I'm gonna tell you things I've learned from this experience and ones like it. What you're gonna learn, uh, start with empathy, the importance of emotional intelligence, mental biases in groups, a technique called parallel thinking, and some just various tips to boost your creative team. So let's start with empathy for the user. When people think of design by committee, they often think of featureitis. Teams will cram in every, uh, every feature in an effort to make their product usable or uh, desirable by as many uh, customers as possible. The Pontiac Aztec <laughs> has earned a spot uh, on many worst car of all time lists. But why? I mean, it's, it's a crossover. It's pretty practical. It's never been plagued with bad uh, manufacturing or uh, recalls. Critics thought it was priced a little high, but that's not really a reason to make it a worst car. No, the problem was bad design, and in fact, bad design process that made this thing uh, a non-seller. GM estimated 50 to 75,000 units a year. They sold fewer than 30 for the five years of production. Uh, 30,000, not 30. <laughs> there might, you might only see 30 these days. But, um, so what did GM do so wrong? They used focus groups and committees basically for the entire design process, even though they had a great lead designer. So the focus group said it should have a cooler for the center console. So it does. They said it should have a tent that folds out of the back. So it does. When I think of bad featureitis software, uh, I think of Microsoft Word and its five toolbars, or its 28 toolbars. Um, you might think of the great examples Eileen gave us earlier from CMSs. Um, and I think those are all fa fantastic examples of featureitis in software. Um, I also think of Eloqua. Eloqua isn't quite as cluttered as some of the other interfaces. It's chock full of features that a marketing team might want, but the app doesn't follow any standard patterns, so they appear cluttered even if there aren't quite as many of them uh, on screen as, as other apps. Uh, and it doesn't teach you how to use the app as you go, so it's very unintuitive. This kind of software really looks great on a PowerPoint slide or in a PDF that you hand a CTO. And the reason it looks great is because it has all of these nice check boxes down the left-hand side of the us versus them column. It's less nice for the actual users. And the reason that teams get into this problem is very simple. They start running the project right in the middle of the process. So this is called the Stanford Design Process. I think a lot of people in this room may be familiar with it or something very similar, like, similar to it. And I think with the products that we've just seen, they started, started at ID8. They heard a problem and they started coming up with solutions immediately. They failed to empathize with, these us with their users, that first step. So they solved a problem, but they didn't solve the right problem or the right people's problem. This is often, uh, at least in enterprise software, a conflict between the goal donor, the person who sets the agenda, and the gold owner, the person who pays for the product. You have a gold donor, gold owner problem. Um, and so a lot of teams will go out and they'll consult the purchases of the product. They'll say, here, uh, CTO, what can we build for you and your team? 
Um, but even if you do want to do that, and there is value in that, make sure you time, take time to build empathy with the actual users, the people who will be doing the day-to-day -day work in your product. Visit them. Watch them work. Read their support tickets. Maybe even respond to or solve some of their support tickets. Build personas. Build proto-personas. And on this section, I'll leave you with this wonderful tweet uh, from just the other day from the delightful Brian Lyles, it does not matter how technically great your stack or application is if it doesn't solve your user's problems. If it doesn't, you've failed. Next, let's, let's talk a little bit about emotional intelligence. Um, so why would we want emotional intelligence? What, what benefit does it bring to our process? Some recent uh, Harvard Business Review research suggested groups are most creative when their members collaborate unreservedly. People stop holding back when there is mutual trust rooted in emotionally intelligent interactions. Um, that's great, but what is emotional intelligence? How do we know if we have it? It's the ability to monitor one's and others' feelings and emotions, to discriminate among them, and to use this information to guide one's thinking and actions. Great. So now we know why we want it. We know what it is. But how do we get it? Mindfulness is the foundation of emotional intelligence, says Mark Coleman. He works for a group called the um, Search Inside Yourself Institute. This is a group that was started um, sort of out of Google and a few other places, and they do mindfulness meditation as a way of uh, building better business relationships. What he's talking about here is there's a difference between I am frustrated and I feel frustrated. One is a statement about yourself. You sort of conflate the emotion with your actual being. And the other is a statement about something that is happening to you. Being able to discriminate between those two things is incredibly important in managing emotions. And in managing emotions is very important in working with teams. Mindfulness will help us experience feelings without letting them take control. So I would like to lead a quick meditation. Um, you can close your eyes if you like. You don't have to. If you don't, sort of, I recommend just focusing, trying not to focus too much on any particular visual stimulus. Think about an emotion that you're feeling right now. Maybe you're anxious about a talk you're going to give later today. Or maybe you're frustrated with a coworker or just really energized by the conference. Maybe it's a positive emotion. One way we can uh, better understand our emotions is to focus on their physical effects. So we're going to do a body scan and just acknowledge how our bodies feel. So I'd like you to start by bringing your attention to your feet. Think about how your toes feel and the soles of your feet. Are they sore? OK, we're not trying to change anything. We're just feeling what our body is, acknowledging and experiencing, bringing our attention to places. So bring your attention up to your calves. And now your knees and your thighs. Think about your stomach. Do you notice any tension or butterflies? Bring your attention up to your chest. Is it tight? Your heart beating fast? These are all OK. Whatever your body is doing right now is fine. Just think about what it is doing. Keep your attention on one part of the body at the time. Think about your arms and your hands. Now walk your attention back up to your back and your shoulders. Let's move up to your neck and your jaw. Maybe you, like me, keep your stress in your jaw. Bring your attention to your eyebrows, your forehead, and your scalp. Good job. If you want to learn more, I highly recommend this book, Search Inside Yourself. Uh, it's written by Google's Jolly Good Fellow. That's his official business title, um, Meng. 
He does a really good job of looking at recent neuroscience research, showing how it affects the, how uh, meditation affects the brain, and then giving you practical meditations that you can use to really change how you interact with other people. Um, he's also just a very happy person. So he's a delight to interact with. Um, one of the key points, I think, which is really great, is only 100 minutes of meditation shows up in fMRI scans of the brain. So if you meditate for 10 minutes a day for 10 days, you will change your brain. So some benefits. You can engage more honestly and creatively in your groups. You can help others do the same when you see their emotions. You can build more emotionally engaging products because you can see the emotions of the customers that you're talking to. And as a bonus, you'll be happier. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about some negative parts of the brain, cognitive biases. In late 1979, uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky wrote a paper on prospect theory. This is the theory of how people make decisions under uncertainty. And in 2002, they won a Nobel Prize for that work. Ever since 2002, bookshelves have been awash with volumes on behavioral economics. You've probably seen of them. Uh, I mean awash. They are everywhere. And most of them have yellow co covers, which I don't understand. There are tons. They've even made it into O'Reilly. Um, so given all of the attention, I wouldn't be surprised if you have seen some of these cognitive biases. The egocentric bias. We tend to think others are like ourselves. The planning fallacy. We're bad at estimating because we're bad at combining probabilities. Right? A 90% chance of success on phase A and a 90% chance of success on phase B is an 81% chance, not quite a nine, not nearly a 90% chance. The Dunning-Kruger effect, which says that inexperienced or unskilled people dramatically overestimate their skill in a subject. The framing effect, which says uh, if I present you the same data in two different ways, I can push you into making two different decisions. For example, if you're considering a life-saving surgery, and I say it has a 90% success rate, you might go for it. But if I say it has a 10% death rate, you might not. Uh, the bias blind spot, this is one of my favorites. It says, if you become aware of these biases, if you study this, you will see them in other people's behavior, and you will attribute their behavior to these biases, but you won't see it in yourself. And in, even introspecting and thinking about how you're thinking through problems, you still won't see them. Um, a lot of people think, well, if I have these biases, I'll get a bunch of people together in a group, and we'll overcome them, right? Two heads are better than one, four are better than two. And sometimes that's true. For egocentrism and availability, these biases, uh, if you have a diverse group, you will start to cancel each other out. So one person says, I think most people would prefer the navigation on the left. And the other person says, well, I think on the right. That causes you to have an actual debate about why you're thinking that. You don't just rely on the snap judgment. Um, or everyone is switching to native on mobile. This is an example of the availability. So maybe you read an article about Facebook having success switching, switching their platform. That, because that comes to mind, you sort of think that it's generally applicable. And you will reach for that example and make decisions based on it. But if everybody has different examples, they'll make different conclusions and you'll discuss. But some groups, but all groups, exacerbate some other biases. So for example, um, groups avoid talking about failure cases. So estimation gets even worse. Right? If you're trying to estimate a project, you need to know about success and failure rates. But groups don't like talking about failure because they don't like talking about contention with other people. Uh, so you might have a discussion like, as soon as I get the requirements for marketing, I'll just take a week and design and implement it. Well, when are they going to get it to you? Right? Is it really going to take a week? Or I'd say we have a 95% chance of making our Q3 numbers. If you uh, ask people their confidence in something, they'll say, oh, it's a 95% chance or a 90% chance, but it will actually be 40% likely of, of uh, coming true. And that's even worse in groups. 
Um, and then my favorite is you're in a meeting and you're deciding an action plan. So Claire will write the spec, Rakesh will do some designs, we'll all meet to discuss, and then I'll code it up. Great, but what happens if Claire goes on vacation for a week and then the next week Rakesh is already planned to be out? You know, you're, you, you don't often in groups discuss all of the failure cases. There are also cognitive biases that only occur in groups. And one of the most powerful is the cascade effect. So for an example of this, let's turn to some research that was done on uh, mock juries. I'll just read you this example. In one mock trial, jurors one, two, and three endorsed a verdict of second degree murder, both privately on paper and in the straw vo vote. Juror four had voted not guilty in private. And he had indicated the highest level of confidence in his choice of not guilty. But what did he do when presented with jurors one, two, and three all saying not guilty before him, or all saying second degree before him? He paused for a second and then said, second degree. Juror seven across the table, an undecided vote, suddenly spoke up and asked, why second degree? The researchers saw a deer in the headlights expression flit across Juror Four's face before he replied, oh, well, it's just obviously second degree. Why does this happen? Um, so this happens for, for two main reasons. One is uh, groups exhibit uh, information biases. So maybe you had estimated several probabilities in your head very quickly, and as other people are describing um, their analysis, you sort of re-estimate how likely things are or how important things are. And the second is social or political effects. So you don't want to be uh, seen as stupid. You want to be seen as making the same decision as the group, uh, which is, um, and, and both of those play together. It's often hard to tease them apart. Also, these can be, um, these cascade effects can be made more complicated by other factors, such as gender. So men will self-censor uh, uh, on more stereotypically feminine subjects like fashion, and women will do so on sports. So my recommendation is avoid ordered events, especially early in the process. So if you have some weeks long or days long or even minutes long process for deciding some UX decision, um, don't put ordered things at the beginning put simultaneous things at the beginning. Because anything that happens early on will cascade down and really change the direction of the flow of the group. So maybe you come into a meeting for one of these design reviews, you state the problem, you design independently for 10 minutes, and then you post the idea simultaneously. So this is from some work we did at Zendesk. Uh, and you can see a bunch of little designs that were posted up on the whiteboard. Another group bias is the common knowledge focus. So this is like, uh, similar to how groups don't like focusing on contention and challenging one another. Um, they tend to focus on what everybody knows. And this could be because uh, what, what other people know is contentious or disagreeable. Or it just could be because uh, if one person on the side thinks something is relevant but the rest of the, the group does not, it won't be interesting to them so that they won't want to discuss it. If someone raises a point of contention, you'll often see the group sort of debate it for a second and then set it aside. This results in what's called in the research a hidden profile. That is an accurate understanding of the world that the group never really uncovers because it doesn't explore that space. So the recommendation here is to make sure that you have a process that invites cognitively peripheral, peripheral people, that is people out there on the sides, um, who have some sort of different perspective to share their knowledge. So for example, if you have a design review, um, bring in people from outside of the UX team, maybe from the marketing team or the QA team, or even bring in customers and make sure there's a formal process in that meeting, maybe at the end, where you ask them for their opinion. Right? Don't just let them uh, speak up if they feel like it because they often won't because of social pressures. Um, another thing that happens in groups a lot, and I think this is again one of the things that people Im that immediately springs to mind as they think about group work, is contention and loss of focus. There's a well-known problem called Dunker's candle problem. Uh, subjects are given a candle, a box of push pins, and uh, a book of matches. And they're asked to attach the candle to the wall. 
And many subjects will sort of think about how to pin the candle to the wall or um, light the candle and then drip some wax and try to use that. What they don't see is that the box that they've been given is a tool. It's not just a carrier for tools. And when you make that aha switch, the solution is really obvious, right? Um, Edward de Bono coined the term lateral thinking to describe this kind of aha problem solving, that it requires a mental switch to make. He later went on to study how groups solve problems, not just individuals, and he was particularly concerned with this sort of Socratic dialogue that many groups use. It's a very confrontational way of working. And um, these sorts of back and forth discussions often have two significant bad results. The first is people get annoyed because it's a contentious discussion. And the second is that the group loses focus. They get on some tangent and follow that argument rather than coming to the real focus of the, of the meeting. So for example, A says, we need a way to indicate that fields have errors. And B says, should we have a red border? And C says, no, 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 that conflicts with the focus. What if you have a focused error field? And B says, all right, well, then how about a red label? And then A says, well, that's, that's kind of hard for some users to, con to see. That's an accessibility problem. And at this point, C just gets frustrated and runs out of the room. <laughs> um, so Edward de Bono invented this sort of corollary, corollary to lateral thinking called parallel thinking. And the process goes something like this. A person comes into the room and states the problem. We need to indicate fields with errors. Then they state a solution. It doesn't even have to be their favorite solution, just a solution that they think could possibly remotely work. Let's add a red border. And then everybody lists pros in the first column of a whiteboard or, or one of these big post-it notes. And the benefit of, of this approach is everybody is in the same emotional engagement on this. They're po thinking positively about this solution. They're thinking about what this brings to the table, why you would want this solution. And then after a minute or two, everybody moves to, to talking about cons, right? So again, everybody is aligned emotionally and thinking about the problem critically, right? Thinking about the cons. And lastly, everybody discusses mitigations to those cons. So maybe you think of variance, or you think of combining the solution with another solution that someone else has posed. The result is ideas get considered more thoroughly. You don't end up on these tangents of argument. And secondly, everybody feels heard at the end, because everybody has had an opportunity to list into each of the columns. Um, so for the final section, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to boost the creativity of your team. And one piece of research I really like was, again, in Harvard Business Review. And they looked at what makes small teams smarter. So they tested the team on brainstorming. They tested them on decision making and on puzzle, puzzle solving. And does anyone have any guesses as to what correlated with higher performance? It was not the IQ of the individual members. It was not group satisfaction or cohesion, nor group motivation. The only datum they found to correlate with higher performance was having more women on the team. Um, and they theorized that this was likely related to social sensitivity, so understanding ways to get around the problems of uh, the, the politics bias and the other ones that we've talked about. Um, so invite more women to your team. Definite pro. Another one I really like is called the 30 circles technique. Um, everybody takes 60 seconds to draw in as many of these 30 circles as possible. And again, uh, art skill is not required. Just you know, fill in as many as possible. So I really like this one that somebody posted online. Um, I really like that he broke out of the single circle and you know, the snowman. I think that's really good. Uh, another exercise that I think is really fun is called Use My Line. If anybody has seen Whose Line Is It Anyway, this is kind of the UX version of that. So it really works on your ability to work off of other people's ideas to sort of improve your ability to remix. So the first person draws a little squiggle and then hands it off. And then the second person has 60 seconds to use it in a drawing. And here I cheated because almost every squiggle can be turned into a puzzle piece. So 
this is, this is weak. Um, so finally, I'm going to sort of give you a process that is very much like some processes they've used and I think takes the benefits of, of the sections that we've talked about here. Please, what I look forward to most is hearing how this relates to your own processes and, and what I might do better to adapt this for the future. But right now I'm thinking, start with meditating 10 minutes a day for two weeks. That'll get you that, brain, that fMRI change, fMRI detectable change. The second is talk to the users of the product. Make sure you actually listen to the people who will be using the software. The third is when you come together for that group meeting, that design session, prime your creativity. Use one of these fun little you know, two, three minute exercises. Then when you do generate ideas for the problem, do so independently. Don't start drawing on a whiteboard where everyone can see um, so that you avoid the, the, the cascade effects. After you've generated ideas independently, reveal them simultaneously. Have everybody tack their designs up on the wall. And then remix. Maybe reorganize into small groups and try to build on other ideas, combine ideas. One of the things we did at Zendesk was um, after the reveal, everybody had to say one thing they really liked about a design that wasn't theirs. And then you had to take that design and combine it with yours in some way. So then lastly, analyze critically. Now this is where you might use parallel thinking or some other critical technique to, as a group, figure out which of these designs really has merit. Um, here I have a bit of a bibliography. Um, this I'm going to take down from the web, so if you want this, make sure you take this all down in notes right now. <laughs> um, happy cat pictures and goat pictures and how to find me online. Um, so that's all I have. I think we have a few minutes left. I don't, my timer is wrong here. Um, but if anybody wants to join me for another meditation, we could try, um, try a different thing to focus on attention. So again, if you feel like it, close your eyes. Don't have to. A lot of meditations begin with the focus on the breath. So We'll do that for now. We'll start there. Just think about your breathing. You don't have to control your breathing. Just focus on the physical act of breathing. Do you notice it in your chest? Or maybe in your nose? Just think about how breathing feels. Now we're going to take our attention off of the breath and to the outside world. Think about what you hear. Just accept sounds. The hum. The clock. What do you hear? Now let's take that attention and bring it back to our breathing. Back outside. And back to your breathing. That's it for that meditation. I really like that one because um, sometimes I find it's hard to think about my breathing for 10 minutes at a time. It's a little boring. Um, but this is nice because it lets you still very consciously use your attention as a tool without getting quite so bored. Um, Jade Ming Tan, the author of Search Inside Yourself, uh, has a saying, if you get one good breath in a day, that's all he wants. So don't worry if you don't get to 10 minutes. I don't often, so um, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>